yeah start now itself appo namaku wait idu cheyyam okay okay bhuvaneshwari ella group il itto ella itlu itto okay so we'll start once the recording message comes we'll start come ni click cheyda ah So, Bhuneshri, I'll make you also the co-host. Yeah, I can admit whenever I'm there. Yes. So, we can start now. Mm. Uh, namaste. I'm very happy to welcome all of you once again to a session of the Literary and Cultural Forum of All India Women's Conference to Andrum Branch. Uh, this is the 23rd session that uh, we are having today. And unfortunately, there is some problem with uh, the link that was circulated in some of the groups. So some people, I think, are having problem joining. Uh, that is why we waited for uh, five minutes before joining. Uh, 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 this is the 23rd session, as I told you. And uh, uh, we have Dr. Jamila. She has uh, joined back after a break. And we were all missing her all these months. And uh, today she herself is the speaker. And I'm very happy that uh, she could uh, prepare and join us with uh, such short notice. She just got back from abroad uh, after a few months of staying with her children. Uh, but in spite of all the hectic schedule, she uh, agreed to talk to us. So I'm really grateful to you, Jamila. And I welcome you warmly to this session. And uh, then all other members and non-members who have joined today, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, and uh, I request Dr. Kamini, who has been uh, helping us in hosting these sessions in uh, Jamila's absence, to uh, please take over and conduct the session. She will also introduce Dr. Jamila. Kamini, thank you, Rusha. Thank thank you, Rusha. Rusha. Uh, it's been it's really so nice to have Jamila back. We really missed her so much because I could never replace her as a host in many of these sessions. Now she is going to talk about um, uh, writing the self, Annie Ernaux. She was awarded a 2022 Nobel Prize in Literature. I'm sure Jamila doesn't need any introduction. All of us know her so well. But if you start reading her curriculum vitae, uh, to talk about Demila itself will take more than an hour. Really, I'm not uh, exaggerating, but I will just highlight her important achievements. She is known not only really known as a teacher and academician, not only really in Kerala, but other parts of the country and also abroad. And we are proud of the fact that she is an international figure. To quote a few, Dr. Demila Begum is currently the chairperson of the curriculum committee of the communication skill in English of the SAP program of Government of Kerala. She was the president of India's nominee to the Executive Council of English and Foreign Language Central University, Hyderabad. She was a head and professor of Department of English and director of UGC Area Studies Center for Canadian Studies at the University of Kerala. And she served the, the university for over 30 years <clears throat> as a faculty member. She was the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Senate member of the university and member of the Academic Council. She was a recipient of the British Council Fellowship for a course on teaching English to students of other languages at the University of London, UK, and is a master trainer for access program of USIS. She was a recipient of the Faculty Research Fellowship and Faculty Enrichment Program of Government of Canada, and she gave lectures and did research at the University of York, uh, Canada. She was instrumental in establishing the Center for Canadian Studies at the University of Kerala. And this is today, even there, you have the major UGC Area Studies Center. She has served as the uh, president of Indian Association for Canadian Studies for two terms. 
and was the secretary of the International Council for Canadian Studies during 2001-2003. She is a member of the committee of the Indian Advisory Council of MHRD New Delhi for Indo Shastri Institute. She is associated with the UGC for in various capacities. And uh, she, she was the academic council member of the Central University of Kashmir in 2010. And she was a UGC visiting faculty at the University of Kakatiya, Warangal, and Jamia Milia, University Delhi. She was also an expert member on the PG Board of Studies of Universities of Pondicherry and Gandhigram. And she was a member of the, uh, coming down to Kerala again, she was a member of the Kerala State Education Advisory Board, chairperson of the textbook committee for standard nine and 10 English texts and member of the textbook commission and member of the committee for restructuring of PG courses. She has over 30 years of teaching and administrative experience and has guided over 22 PhDs and 40 MPhils. And she has participated and presented papers at many international and national conferences in India and in countries like UK, USA, Canada, Australia, Belgium, and Japan. What more you need from an academician? And we are so proud of you, Jamila. And uh, she's the most fitting person to talk to us about this um, uh, Nobel Prize winner. I welcome you, Jamila, to this guest. I also welcome all the, uh, the members of the AIWC of other branches, and also the members of AIWC in Kerala. I also welcome the president of Trivandrum AWC, Sundar Ramushna Pillai, of course, Usha, who's so much the backbone of such programs. So once again, welcome all of you. Over to you, Jamila. Thank you. Thank you, Kamini. Uh, it's very pleasant to listen to a CV uh, and think it is somebody else and uh, not me. Thank you for those very kind words uh, and for introducing me. Greetings to all the members of the AIWC. Uh, it is always a pleasure uh, to come on this platform, uh, not only to host talks, but also to give talks. As Usha said, I remember two years back uh, when uh, Louis Gleek uh, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. I did my first talk on this platform on Gleek's poetry. And then Usha and I sat together and we decided we should have a literary and cultural forum for the Trivandrum chapter of AIWC. And since then, without a break, we have been going on having talk after talk, not only on literature, but on a lot of other uh, topics, uh, which have been very useful as well as interesting for the forum members. Today, uh, when uh, we talked about what we would have for this session, uh, Two years have passed and I come back to talk to you about another Nobel Prize winner. And this time uh, it is Annie Theresa Blanche Arnaud, a French writer. Whenever a woman gets a Nobel Prize, we look back at all the other writers who have won Nobel Prizes. 119 prizes so far since it was instituted in 1904. And today we find that only 17 women have been awarded the Nobel Prize. It may sound strange. Uh, it is not because women have been writing lesser literature or literature with no impact, or is it because women still continue to be discriminated on various fronts. So whenever a woman writer gets a Nobel Prize, it is a time for celebration. And I think we as women should celebrate the fact that a woman like Annie Erno has won the Nobel Prize. She deserves to be acclaimed. She deserves to be praised for this achievement. But this has not come easily to her. It has come from years of hard work, years of trying to portray her experiences, her society, her life, her parenthood, all in a very different way from what men would have written about her. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Usha Jayashree is trying to get in. Will you give her the message? 
Yes, yes, I'll. I'll. Yeah. So it is with a lot of pleasure and with a lot of happiness that I want to talk to you about uh, Annie Erno. Uh, I would like to share a picture of her for those of you who have not uh, seen. Annie Erno. Uh, suppose you can see the screen now. Can you? Yes, Jamila, we can see. You can proceed. This is Annie Erno. She was born in 1940. So she is now uh, 82 years old. And a writer who has been writing since she was in her 20s. Her first publication came at a time after her marriage uh, to uh, her husband's name was Gally Mart, and it was in 1974 that she made her first publication, which was called Cleaned Out. Subsequently, she wrote A Frozen Woman in 1981, and that led to the breakup of her marriage with her husband, and she lives alone today. But one may ask why she hid the fact that she was writing. She did not want to, her husband to know that she was writing. She wrote in secret, told her husband she was working on a project. And finally, only when it was published, her husband came to know about it. So this speaks volumes of the discrimination of women because she wanted to write from her heart she wanted to write the truths. She wanted to be brutally direct and working class and sometimes obscene. So these were things that perhaps made her hide the fact that she was a writer. We know of many writers who have hid their creative writings and who were published after they passed away. Emily Dickinson is one such example. She never published during her lifetime, but became one of the most famous American poets after her death. We know George Eliot did not write in her true name, Mary Ann Evans. She took a man's name when she published her works. So this gives us or gives us a view of what uh, women face when they turn to writing. Because writing is seen as something that belongs to the man's world. Especially in France, if you look at the French language, we find that there is no neuter gender in French, in the French language. It is either masculine or feminine. For example, the table is la table, which is feminine. But the pen, la pen, is masculine. So you find that what in English we take for granted as neuter gender, does not exist in the French language. So for a French writer to break those taboos and to start writing was in, did indeed uh, demand a lot of courage and passion to write what she felt. She herself has compared her use of language to a knife. And she says, it's like, uh, I use a knife to cut life, to, to show it in with it, all its blood and to show the world what women feel, what women think and what women would like to express. She is the author of some 20 works of fiction and is considered to be France's mo most important literary voice. She won many awards like the Prix Renaudot for her book called A Man's Place. And a man's place is all about her father. It's a man's story. It is her father's story. And more recently, she received the International Strega Prize, the prize for mentor and the French American translation prize for, the, for her work, which is called The Years. And it is this work, The Years, that has won her the Nobel Prize in Literature. Of course, taking into consideration her entire body of work during her lifetime. 
She was also shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize and the Warwick Prize for Women in Translation. She writes in French and therefore what we have got is a translation of her writings. And, I, and since I don't know French, I could not read her in the original. I could read her only in translation. But the translation itself was so fraught with so much, or you would say charged with electricity as it were, so passionate. And it is like she has distilled images in the crucible of her experience. So it's a kind of diary form that she sometimes uses. It's an auto and sometimes ethnography that she uses. She mixes a number of genres in order to convey her feelings. And this is also to say that no traditional or conventional form of writing is um, convenient or is, uh, um, is something that a woman can use in order to convey her, uh, her feelings and her thoughts. So she chooses another form of writing, or she finds her own ways of writing. And let us look at what kind of writing she has been writing. They are very confessional. They are autobiographical accounts of female experience. They are written in the first person, and it is a realist mode of feminist writing. It's a form of feminist Bildungs Roman which continues to characterize much Anglo-American women's writing. I'll come back to say, tell you what Bildung's Roman means. Edna provides a predominantly existential or materialist analysis of women's social situation. Now, I would like to take each one of these to talk about Edna. She is confessional. She is autobiographical. And when we talk about autobiography, uh, the writer that immediately comes to mind is my story and Kamala Das. Here in her writings, she has um, what we would call a girl's story, a woman's story, and a man's story. Now, uh, this is something that uh, makes us feel that here is a writing which tries to address not only her own personal life, but her mother's life, her father's life. It's, it's, it makes a very interesting uh, collection of trying to build up what really happened to a writer like Arno as she lived through her childhood and her adulthood, her teenage years, to become a mature woman that she is today the people who have influenced her in various ways. And often this is written in the first person. And as I said, when you write in the first person, you are becoming very confessional. Of course, we have writers who have called themselves confessional writers, confessional poets like Sylvia Plath, who could write confessional poetry and talk about her, uh, what you say, the truth of her experience. Now, people or writers always shy away when they are writing an autobiography and from explicitly stating uh, obnoxious and obscene things. But with Erno, this is not the case. As a woman writer, she brings the body to the center of her writings. The, the, the changes that have happened to her body from childhood to teenager to maturity not only to her body, to her mother's body, and also how she is related to the mother figure, the mirror stage, as we call it, where you become or you try to be what society wants you to be, the social self, and what Simone de Beauvoir around this time, the 1960s that Erna was writing, um, called the second sex. And where she, with, with Helen Sissou, she was trying to say that women should write the body feminine, a creature feminine, where Ellen Sisu was saying, write the feminine or write the self, write the body. Now, to go back a little to Simone de Beauvoir, we find that one of the most uh, famous and uh, articulate of the French thinkers of the second wave of feminism was Simone de Beauvoir. We'll come to Simone de Beauvoir a little later. 
But just keep this in mind when we are talking about confessional and autobiographical accounts, we are talking not just about the personal, but we are also talking about the political. That is finding yourself in a society, in a world which is other than yourself because you do not live in a vacuum. You live in a world where many things are happening around you. You live in a world where there are many beliefs that are circulated. You live in a world where religion uh, becomes central as Catholicism we know in France was very strong, especially during the uh, 1940s and 50s. This was also the time of the World War, if you remember, in the 1940s and 45s, uh, the, the World War and German occupation of Northern France totally devastated the countryside that was uh, where she was born. The place that she was born is known as Ivito, Y-V-E-T-O-T. Ivito is a small rural town where her mother and father uh, lived for a long time, though for a short space of time, they moved away from Ivitot, but came back to it. This was also a place where there was a convent school, which she attended. So these were all things that happened around her. And that is why when we say the personal is political and the political is personal, we accept the fact that no writer can write only about herself. Because herself, the notion of herself, is made of all these components. Now, what is a form of feminist Bildungsroman? Uh, we have Bildungsroman, which is to tell a story from the time that you are old, you are old, and then you begin to tell your story from your childhood to your mature age. A 90-year-old uh, narrator, as in The Stone Angel by Margaret Lawrence, a Canadian writer, she begins in Stone Angel is uh, uh, accepted as one of the most seminal works of Canadian literature. She writes what happened to her in a flow of thoughts uh, which take her from her 90 years to her childhood and to the fact to her childhood, her mother's childhood, her grandmother's childhood. So you move, it is like we at this point of time trying to recall all that has happened to us in our childhood. And we also know that when we try to recall, when we try to bring back memory, there is no linear form. It is always chaotic. Thoughts come one after the other. And if there are a number of photographs to aid you, then you look at the photographs and try to remember what had happened at that time and when that photograph was taken and what your thoughts were at that point of time. And that is why today we say that uh, Erno gives us a women's social, a social situation. It's a materialist analysis of the situation. Now, having said that, uh, I would uh, like to come back to uh, this notion of what makes Erno a really great writer. I told you that she was born in a very small uh, working class Catholic family in Ivitot, which is a small town in Normandy, where her parents had a grocery store and a cafe. And this is how she uh, describes Ivitot. Remember, she has left Ivitot, which is her childhood home. She now lives in Paris, and she writes about the small town that was once uh, there and which made her the, the, the social political situations that made her the war, the uh, penury, the poverty that they went through, how agricultural land became industrialized and how when it became industrialized factory workers or industry workers were needed. And all through that you have this Catholic church and the nuns and the values that they propagated on one side uh, of her uh, familial life. This is how she describes. Ivitot is a cold town situated on a wind swept plateau lying between, between Rouen and Le Havre. Le Havre is a port and Le Havre was bombed during the uh, World War II 
and this was occupied by the Germans and the Allies had to come there, the soldiers had to come there to force the Germans out. So uh, the political situation was also something that really affected her life because uh, poverty, soldiers marching on the land and the land itself cold and situated on a windswept plateau. And then she continues to say, at the turn of the century, it was an important administrative center and the trading capital of a region entirely dependent on farming and controlled by a group of landowners. So you get this um, um, background or the history, what she calls the ethnography. You, you, you talk about ethnicity, you talk about historiography. And when you talk about ethnicity, you're talking about uh, small groups of people, minority groups. Here is a small minority group in Normandy. I mean, you're talking about historiography, you are trying to make new history of the land and the people. History has always been written. We know that during the World War, uh, Le Havre was bombed, but we don't know what happened to the people there from the point of view of a woman speaker, one who has experienced it. And that is what she gives us in some of her novels. When she was 12, there was, some, there was an incident that totally devastated her. And this she writes about when in the uh, book, which she calls Shame. Shame was published only in 1998, much after she had uh, written A Man's Place, which was in 1992, and A Girl's Story, which was to come later in 2019 and a woman's story which came out in 1990. So it's the 90s that we are looking at. But when she writes, she's not writing about the 90s, but she is writing about the uh, 50s and 60s and 70s, the years that have gone by. She begins the novel Shame with a very strike, and with all her novels, we find very striking uh, initial sentences. For example, in a woman's story, she begins with this, uh, with this uh, sentence, my mother died. In shame, she begins with a sentence like, my father tried to kill my mother one Sunday in June in the early afternoon. My father tried to kill my mother one Sunday in June. Now the directness with which she uh, approaches her experience is something that you don't find, say, perhaps in a male writer. And this father figure, if you go back to the complexity of feminist theory, we find that if you go back to Freud and the Oedipal complex and the Electra complex was rewritten by writers like uh, theorists like Julia Kristeva, who would not talk about a, a daughter's relationship with the father or a son's relationship with the mother but rather the close bonding between the mother and the daughter. So it's the continuation. Like when, when she talks about her mother delivering her in one of her uh, novels, and she says, when I was born, I became a continuity of my mother. I became something, I carried my mother with me. But at the same time, there is a rejection of the mother as well. I don't want to be like the mother. I want to be someone else. I want to be away from that mother figure. But that again comes from what we would call social implications. She, because years have passed, what her mother was at one time is not the acceptable figure she can be in another point of time. She must change. She must become part of the society, new society to which she belongs. That is the 1970s. In this uh, work, uh, Shane, she talks about trying to find the truth about what had happened on that June early afternoon when the father tried to kill my mother. She says uh, her mother had been, uh, today we would perhaps be uh, talking about a situation where the, mother, the male figure is silent and the um, woman figure 
uh, trying to keep on talking and nag the husband. So it's, it's some of these situations that she creates are so um, universal, like anything that can happen in any house. Not the killing, of course, but the nagging, the nagging of the father figure. The mother wants something done, she keeps on nagging him. Finally, he gets so ang angry, he jumps up from the table, drags her by the head, takes her down to the cellar, takes out a knife that is there in the cellar and tries to cut her. And then, of course, there is a whole lot of confusion. The daughter comes in, tries to save the mother, and finally everything calms down. And before evening, she says, we all went out for a bicycle ride. My father, my mother, and myself. Everything is forgotten. But then the shame has remained with her. The shame of seeing her father like that. It, it is something that really disturbs her and keeps disturbing her throughout the, um, the work, A Man's Place. Now, as the title itself suggests, A Man's Place. But before we come to that, I want to share with you uh, the, uh, the story of the, the mother. These are some of her subjects. Arnold's work broaches a range of taboo subjects from abortion to female sexual passion to the death of a parent from Alzheimer's disease and providing a detailed and at times disturbing representation of them. Actually, the description of the Alzheimer's disease and what happens to her mother from a very strong figure to suddenly one who does not know what is happening to her and who has lost all control over her thoughts I mean, it's, it's very uh, touching uh, language that she uses. And when you read it, you almost feel like this can happen to any one of us. As we grow older, we lose our hold on our senses. And then you don't know what you, you cannot even identify your own children. And then you are put in a, in a hospital and in the hospital, you, you die. Now this, this is how the woman's story begins. This, the woman's story is all about her mother and of course about her because it's a confessional tale. And here, uh, in the, published in 1919, this is how this begins. I shall continue to write about my mother. She is the only woman who really meant something to me. And she had been suffering from senile dementia for two years. Perhaps I should wait until her illness and death have merged into the past, like other events in my life, my father's death and the breakup with my husband, so that I feel the detachment, which makes it easier to analyze one's memories. But right now, I'm incapable of doing anything else. So the, the, you, you, oh, you almost uh, feel with her. And I think that is the power of Erno's writing. When she writes, she is not just writing about her experience. She's actually drawing us into the vortex of human experience and saying, look at this, look at my mother, and I shall continue to write about my mother. And she says elsewhere, pictures are no substitute for writing because pictures do not give us the essence of the, the feelings that one can communicate in writing. And she goes on with these words. I would also like to capture the real woman, the one who existed independently from me, born on the outskirts of a small Normandy town, and who died in the geriatric ward of a hospital in the suburbs of Paris. The more objective aspect of my writing will probably involve a cross between family history, sociology, reality, and fiction. This book can be seen as a literary venture as its purpose is to find out the truth about my mother, a truth that can be conveyed only by words. Neither photographs, nor my memories, nor even the reminiscences of my family can bring me this truth. And yet, in a sense, I would like to remain a cut below literature. And then she, she tries to uh, bring the woman alive and she says, my mother was not just passive, she was not just hardworking, she had a violent temper, she had outbursts of affection, re reproachful attitude. I see her 
I try not to see them as facets of her personality, but to relate them to her own story and social background. Now, those uh, emotional outbursts that she is talking about actually comes from her mother's, and she goes back in history to tell how her mother was, uh, was working on the farm uh, along with her grandmother, but she was always very ambitious. And because she was ambitious, she uh, left, um, she, she wanted her children to study and she also left the farm work in order to start a grocery store on her own. And, and during that time she marries uh, and together with her husband, they begin the cafe. And you all through the story, she tells us about the resilience and the courage and the determination of the mother to raise themselves in social rank from just being uh, at the lowest rung of the social scale to an upper rung. And she also talks about behavior. She talks about how culture becomes very important for her mother. She says, factory girls are seen as uh, easy girls for sex, but her mother never allowed anyone to touch her private parts. So the, 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 you, you, through her words, she draws a very stunning picture of her mother. And this is again a few words. I, I, I was so touched by these words, I wanted you to share this with you. And here her story stops for there was no longer a place for her in society. She was slowly turning insane. She was suffering from Alzheimer's disease, the name given by the doctors to a form of senile dementia. And they say, over the past few days, I found it more and more difficult to write, possibly because I would like never to reach this point. Yet I know I have no peace of mind until I find the words that will reunite the demented woman she had become with the strong, radiant woman she once was. This is life, and this is what perhaps um, uh, is in store. And she also talks about the daughter's duty and responsibility, and she says, on several occasions, I felt the sudden urge to take her away and give up everything else just to look after her. Maybe every daughter goes through that. You want to take to be with your mother. But then I realized instantly that I was incapable of doing such a thing. I still felt guilty about having put her into a home, even if, as people said, I had no alternative. She lived through another winter. And he goes on to say, this is not biography, this is not history, this is something far, far more than that. At this point, I, I want to go back to what I was saying about my story. Now, uh, one of the things that we find with her writing is that uh, there is an overlap of events, overlap of thoughts, uh, throughout her works so that you you don't feel complete after reading like you take up a book and you and you read it and you think this is a complete novel or this is a complete fiction or this is a complete biography or this is a complete autobiography it is never like that because when you go to the next book you get this feeling that the first flows into the other because thoughts are chaotic Thoughts cannot be restricted to different sections. And therefore, when she talks about a man's story, naturally, the mother figure comes into that again. Her own figure comes into that. So you find this, this is something perhaps um, what we would call a continuity of writing that we find in feminist uh, writing, where a woman writer uh, never really leaves the center of her uh, thoughts and experiences. There was always a circumference of what say concentric circles that go round and round her as she puts uh, events and emotions and thoughts into words. And this is exactly what you find in uh, Arnaud's writing also. I'll talk to you about shame. And it is not just the shame that she felt as something that came from her parents' occupation or their financial troubles or their working class background. But it is also a different kind of shame and the shame that comes from her body. 
And here it is that we talk about how the body is made central to the rightness. And in this book, The Years, which won her the Nobel Prize in 2022, as the uh, caption there, it's not very clear, but uh, it's a label that was there, which says the Nobel Prize 2022. And this is her most acclaimed book, The Years, published in 2008. It describes herself, the wider French society from the end of the World War to the present, and unlike the previous books, the year, the year in the years, Erno writes about herself in the third person, calling her character she rather than I. And the book, as you know, has received numerous awards and honors. Now, this so, slow transition from the I persona to the she persona is also very important because uh, the subjectivity with which she writes her early uh, novels is not lost, but at the same time, there is a distancing of the character. And she looks at a character outside herself as the experiencing self and she as the narrating self. So it, 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 this, it is this gap between the narrating self and the experiencing self that makes literature and what do you say, writing, uh, something that uh, cuts across uh, time uh, it cuts across age, it cuts, it cu even cuts across the uh, social and what you say, cultural hemispheres. Because she's talking basically about human experience, women's experience. Now, uh, one of the things that we find, especially in the years and in her uh, uh, book, which she calls My Story, I'm sorry, not my story, a girl's story. Uh, I just want you, uh, against this, I want you to uh, listen to this, where she is talking about uh, a girl's story. And this is what she says in the girl's story. In the girl's story, particularly, she talks about a young woman at the end of the 1950s, when she loses her virginity at a summer colony in Orne in Normandy. This is a, a summer uh, break that she, along with her friends, go when she is 18 years old. And there she loses her virginity and she writes about the uh, entire, um, feel, her entire feelings and how she gets caught in it. The reactions to her behavior, which she herself contributes to make known, have the effect that she is expelled from the community. It took her decades to write about one of the most agonizing events of her life, confusing sexual experience she had in the summer of 1958 when she was 18, which left her feeling ashamed, abandoned, and resulted in depression and an eating disorder. And I'm endowed by shame's vast memory, more detailed and implacable than any other, a gift unique to shame. I wanted to forget that girl. Now, uh, uh, along with this, what uh, uh, what we find in uh, my story uh, is the way in which uh, she gets pregnant and she wants to abort it. And we come across one of those uh, uh, political um, and uh, administrative um, rules that disallow uh, abortion and how she goes to a quack in order to get an abortion. And very graphically, she describes about these experiences as she walks as she walks along narrow alleys. Now, this was something that was uh, something that the, um, the French uh, women were trying to fight against. And we know that during Simone de Beauvoir's time, uh, there, was, um, uh, there was an attempt to um, legalize abortion. And in 1991, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, along with Giselle Halimi, wrote manifesto of 343 women who wanted abortion but could not get abortion. In France, about, remember the, it was Catholic, or the religion was Catholicism, and Catholicism disallowed uh, abortion. So this young girl of 18 
uh, caught in a situation where she doesn't know what to do, where she doesn't know how she can tell her mother about it. She hides it from her mother and she gets friends to help her out. She goes through a lot of harrowing experience like using a knitting needle in order to abort herself. Then she goes to a quack and she begins to bleed. She doesn't know how to stop the bleeding. And then she gets into all kinds of situations until finally uh, she gets the child ab uh, aborted and she talks about it. But it was not easy. And the, the, that particular narration in a girl's story is something that as women, we realize that unwanted pregnancy uh, that girls get into and a law that refuses ab abortion. So what do these girls do? And this is something that it still goes on. Recently, when I was in US, there was a law that was uh, that came out which said that abortion was made illegal. So if there is no legal abortion, you cannot go to a physician. You cannot go to a doctor to get it. Out. So you children have to either uh, deliver the baby or uh, the, the teenagers who get into such scraps have to deliver the baby or go to quacks to get it. So this is uh, in a way what we say uh, a way in which uh, uh, French writing and particularly women's writing addresses some of those seminal issues that are part of the social uh, agenda and trying to show the world that this is this is really what happens if you do not have an abortion law. And in this uh, uh, work, uh, you should read this, uh, my, uh, the uh, girl's story as you should read the woman's story. Those are two of the books that really um, I can't get back Usha, to my slide. Share again. Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, got it. Thank you. And she says about the images in one's head, they will vanish all at the same time. Like the millions of images that lay behind the foreheads of the grandparents dead for half a century, and of the parents also dead. Images in which we appeared as a little girl in the midst of beings who died before we were born. Just as in our own memories, our school children are there next to our parents and schoolmates. So the years, the continuity of life is established here in these books. And one day we will appear in our children's memories among their grandchildren and the people not yet born. So it's a long line of history. Like sexual desire, memory never stops. It pairs the dead with the living, real with imaginary beings and dreams with reality. Now, I just want to give you a sample of the kind of writing that we find in the years. You'll notice that she makes a sentence like this, and then every uh, other sentence is not something that is complete. There's a continuity. There is no full stop after each of these sentences. So the stylistic technique that she is using here is to uh, is to show how crowding of images is a part of our human mind. And if you look at the images themselves, they are so disparate. They are so different from one another. Look at, and just quickly read out some of them. They never grew tired of talking about the winter of 42, the bone chilling cold, the hunger, and the rutabagas, and the food provisions, and the tobacco vouchers, and the bombardments, the war wars. The aurora borealis that heralded the coming of the war, so the sky. The bicycles and carts on the roads during the rout, the looted shops. The victims searching the debris for their photos and their money. The arrival of the Germans. Every person at the table could say exactly where in what city they had landed. And the English always courteous. The Americans inconsiderate. The neighbor in the resistance, that is the Germans. The collabos, the girl ex whose head was shaved after liberation and lay Havre, the port, raised to the ground, and where nothing at all remained, that the black, remained the black market. So it's a graphic picture of um, what she writes. And it's a kind of slip, what she calls a slippery narrative. That's a term that she uses. It will be a slippery narrative composed in an unremitting continuous tense. And that's what we have here. 
absolute, devouring the present as it goes, all the way to the final image of our life, an outpouring, but suspended at regular intervals by photos, scenes from films, freeze frames or memories, the things that have made it singular, not because of the nature of the elements of our life, whether external or internal, but because of their combinations, each unique unto itself. So to this, incessantly not she of photos will correspond. In mirror image, the she of writing and not the I of writing. And so we see why, why did she write? She wrote to make the person, I'm sorry, the personal political. She wrote of herself, it's a psychological exploration. She wrote of cultural, social, political history, gender, social disparities. And to, to quote Simone de Beauvoir and to set what he has written against this, you will find that man is defined as a human being and a woman as a female. Whenever she behaves as a human being, she is said to imitate the male. And representation of the world, like the world itself, is the work of men. They describe it from their point of view, which they confuse with absolute truth. So this is a statement that Simon de Beauvoir is making against a male-dominated patriarchal society, and she's talking for a change. Now, the girl's story that I was narrating to you, uh, this is the way it starts. It says, I too wanted to forget that girl, really forget her, that is, stop yearning to write about her. That is the girl of 18. This girl and her desire and madness, her idiocy and pride, her hunger and her blood that ceased to flow, I have never managed to do so. There are always references to her in my journey. The girl of S, that is summer, the girl of 58, 1958, when she was 18 years old. For the last 20 years, I have jotted 58 among my other writers. It's perpetually missing piece, always postponed, the unqualifiable book. Because that is the time when she really understands her own body and begins to realize what can happen to her if she is not dead. And in another of her works, which is called Happening, and as the title itself suggests, the in form that is used, the continuous form. And she says that I'm certain that all these things that I've talked about has happened. Maybe the true purpose of my life is for my body, my sensations, my thoughts to become writing. In other words, something intelligible and universal, causing my existence to merge into the lives and heads of other people. And I think that is she has actually been able to do that. And that has won her the Nobel Prize. So thank you. That was uh, a little something that I wanted to share with you, my own thoughts and my own uh, interpretation of the books that I read about her. Now the floor is open for discussion and uh, anyone who would like to ask. Thank you, Jamila. That was so interesting. It's like a story. It was never ending and wished we could be more. Right? Right. Thank you. <laughs> All the experiences in life make one right, isn't it? Okay. Any questions or any doubts or anything you want to add or discuss with Jamila? You can do that. Anyone? I have, uh, for those of literature students who have joined, I purposely kept out all the theoretical part of it as far as I could uh, so that it could be uh, appealing and interesting for the others who have joined. But those of you literature students who would like to know more about uh, any of the other aspects, you can always ask. Hello, madam. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. You have made an excellent presentation, no doubt about that. You could portray the author in, a, in its original, in her original, as well as her writings interpreted with the full of life and uh, with the dimensions of uh, 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 including the social, cultural, and the other relevant aspects of life. Very, very interesting and very enthusiastic. And uh, we, we are looking forward to have more from you. Sir. Very interesting. Thank you very much. All the best. Thank yes, you. Sir. Very interesting. Thank you, sir. Everyone got, everyone got carried away by the experiences. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. yes, because uh, 
uh, we read tidbits about her writing when the news came about her Nobel Prize. And then uh, in Malayalam, Madhupumi had covered uh, her writings and her life in one of the issues. Uh, but uh, in that background also, you have really given a very comprehensive uh, coverage about her writings. And I'm sure everybody would want to go back and read her books. I don't think many have uh, uh, even heard about her or read her writings. Uh, now yes. that she has come into the limelight, I'm sure many of us would... Uh, go back and try to read the books and especially the two books that you have recommended. So thank you so much, Jamila. And I'm sorry that today there was some uh, problem with the link that was posted and many people have been unable to join. I'm really sorry for that because many more wanted to join and uh, uh, they could not join because of some problem with the link, which I didn't realize. Yes. So now I've circulated the uh, fresh link and uh, some could join at least midway. And otherwise, uh, it is on YouTube. And uh, I can post the YouTube link in the chat if you want. And uh, the others can uh, watch on YouTube right from the beginning. So I'll put that in the chat. And those of you who are uh, interested in watching on YouTube, please take it from uh, there. Uh, Jamila, can I ask you something? Yeah, sure. Because you're talking about Alzheimer's. Mother had Alzheimer's. Which year did her mother die? Uh, I think it. Uh, I'm not very sure about that. Uh, because we are talking of Alzheimer's these days, so those days also it was documented, isn't it? Yeah, it was. Uh, like her, uh, she she was born in forty. So it, it, I think it may be in, because a woman's story and all got written in the 2010 and all that. Maybe in another mm. ten years back. Oh. So then Alshumas was there even then, you know, like we're yeah. talking Alshumas more these days, but maybe yeah. it's documented them, isn't yeah. it? But she is writing uh, her uh, her narration is now, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Because of, think, uh, yeah, the woman's story got written in 1990. 1990. So okay. She wrote in 1990, so okay. her mother had already died at that time. Yeah. Another thing you're talking is your same thing, uh, there's a continuity of writing you're talking, isn't it? Yeah. Now, continuity of writing, does it mean the content or the uh, whatever she wrote was uh, the same similarity in what she wrote or what? No, no, no. Uh, by continuity of writing, what I meant was that, like when she writes about shame, she mm -hmm. writes about her father trying to kill her mother. She repeats that, but uh, writes in another way about it. Like it's not the same sentences or not like that. But then uh, new impressions about that particular moment. Uh, but that idea um, is there. No idea. The idea, yeah. The uh -huh. idea sort of, uh, it's like a web, you know, like what I found in her writing was there's a kind of interconnectedness with everything that happens to her. Like when she talks about shame, mm -hmm. she, she begins with saying that she belonged to the working class and because that of that, she did not have very pretty dresses and all, like the convent going girls. And then her mother wanted to educate her. So she was sent to a school. And there also she did not have money, enough money to dress and be like others. So there's always this feeling of shame of being uh, uh, not um, accepted by society. Yeah. That was, and then uh, she, she is actually a professor in literature in uh, Paris now. Oh. And she writes, yeah. So she studied, uh, she's, one, her, that was her mother's determination actually. To, oh. Her mother was almost illiterate, but made her daughter come up in life. And she has two sons also. Oh, yes. he writes about them. Okay. I was about to ask if she had any children. Yeah, she had oh, two children. What about her siblings? Did she have any no. siblings? She did not have any siblings. She, so she had a sister died. who, yeah, she had a sister who died, and then after many years she was born. Her parents decided that they were only wanted one child, and that they wanted to educate her and make her come up in society. So it's all her mother's determination. Like you, we see women like that around, no, who yeah. want their daughters to do well and yeah, yeah. sacrifice anything. She, the mother, makes a lot of sacrifices in order to. Uh, yeah, her interesting. So when you contrast that picture with the uh, lady oh, yeah. with Aljimez later, that yeah. is when yeah. you really yeah. 
feel sorry that uh, how it happens to yeah. the strongest of uh, women and then she is reduced to a helpless person who has uh, uh, they say that she, uh, i think she's right somewhere that she had lost her thoughts yeah such uh, language she uses that she, she doesn't, yeah she doesn't her remember daughter. her grandchildren she doesn't remember her daughter I know. she doesn't remember uh, uh, that she has got to wear clothes so it's a lot of things like that, little, little things uh, which are part of passion. Yeah, and when you uh, think of her as that strong woman who was uh, yeah, exactly. you know, so determined to uh, yeah. bring her daughter up to, uh, I mean, out of the yeah. level that they were in. Yeah, right. Mother's dream. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. the mother's dream. So that's why I said at the beginning, you know, the mother-daughter relationship is so strong and uh, the way she dreams for her daughter. But at the end of it, what is sad is uh, she, uh, Erno says that she wanted to take her mother uh, home and look after yes. her and all, but she cannot because yeah. she's caught in her own life oh. and uh, her own uh, work. Yeah. That, that happens with a lot of children, I think. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. So you, they, she's put in a geriatric ward. So yeah, uh, uh, there's something in the chat box, Chitra, okay? Thank you, Jamila Ji. Excellent, interesting. Like attending a literature class long time ago during my college days. Thank you again. Thank you. I think Radhika was trying to say something. Guru also has written just quite interesting talk. Would like to read those works. You have really brought out the circumstances and the life story so very clearly. And now when we read we can correlate to her emotions and feeling much more. Thank you, Jamila Ji. Then Radhika Rajagopal has written, thank you, Jamila, for an excellent presentation for as usual. An interesting introduction to the author definitely whets the appetite. Samsung, I don't know who that Samsung is. I don't know. I ha I'll have to see once more. So interesting. Must read this author. As usual, your presentation is so lucid and in simple language. Read, read reviews, but the talk was impressive. And another person read me from another computer. Thank you, ma'am. Really wants to read this. Yeah, that was the intention to make to get uh, readers to read yes. uh, and to relate it to. And also, it uh, to me for me, it's like I wish I had studied literature. <laughs> That I think all of it's us wish after. I really feel I should have done study literature anyway. No, it's I'm tired and old now. Jamila. So, yeah. No we point. Jamila, we all feel that we miss being her students. I know. I could have been her student. Her student. <laughs> yeah. You are now. You are listening to my talk, so it's almost like being students. I really have missed something. <laughs> Sri Kala is there. I can see Kala who was, who was a student. So maybe the student should be able to say something. You have an unmuted Sri Kala. It is not unmuted. Can we do it, Usha? Please unmute uh, Sri Kala. Patanilla. She can't do it. We can't do it, is it? No, I can only ask her to unmute. I think by just touching the screen, you can unmute yourself. Just clicking on the screen. The mute button. That's the oh. mute, mute button. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Now, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. ma'am, uh, was she influenced by uh, the the uh, feminist theories, or was she under the influence of any of the feminist writers? Yes, yes, she had. I actually didn't bring that too much into this talk because she was writing at the time when the second wave, the first wave of feminism had come when they were thought about asking for political rights. And you know that it was during the 60s and 70s that the feminist movement broke out in uh, America and right earnest. And this was the time that Erna was also uh, uh, in her 20s and 30s. She was born in 1940. So by 60s and 70s, uh, the second wave of feminism was very strong. Now, to, as a French writer, she was influenced naturally by Simone de Beauvoir and Helen Sissou. Now, Simone de Beauvoir, as we know, with her, uh, her theoretical work, The Second Sex, 
uh, she was trying to underline the fact that a woman is not born but made. That is, a woman is not born as a woman with restrictions, but she is made what she is by the society in which she is born. In other words, patriarchal society uh, controls her and taboos many things for her and tries to put her into a frame where she is a woman. Or, or they would say she acts like a man. So the woman has to uh, have certain forms of behavior and um, uh, expression were, re were restricted to her. Now, Helen Sisu, so Simon de Beauvoir, particularly in the second sex, we find uh, trying to get across to women's writing the fact that we need to break this shell, the shell of oppression. It was with Helen Sisu's A Creature Feminine, uh, The Laugh of the Medusa, her uh, theoretical work, The Laugh of Medusa, Helen Sisu. Helen Sisu was to talk about women writing women, A Creature Feminine. And she says, women should write women. Let women try to center women in their writings. And around this time, Elaine Shaw Walter, another uh, uh, theorist in Britain, was talking about the notion of gynocentrism. That is, the body, the gyno, the body had to be made central in the writing of women. And that is why when Erno writes, she actually writes about her body, what happens to her body as a child then when she is in her teenage years, then when she has her first sexual experience, then she talks about how she has this abortion. Then she talks about uh, how her mother, the relationship between her mother and her father, what it was. So the, all through her writings, you have this, uh, at the back of it, you have this notion of uh, theorists who are guiding her. Also, we find that uh, during the third wave of feminism, particularly psychological feminism, we talk about Simone de Beauvoir and uh, Elaine Shorter and all in, in the notion of social feminism but, and gynocriticism. But when we come to writers like Julia Kristeva, uh, we find that, and Lucy Rigare, we find that the, uh, the, theor the theoretical stance moves from social and cultural implications to psychological implications. So here, Kristeva talks about the mirror stage. And particularly, the mirror, there is a reference to the mirror in that quote that I showed you. Um, it, uh, and we find that Kristeva was trying to uh, show how Freud, Freud's notion of Oedipal and Electra complex really did not exist in a woman's mind. But the, the mirror image that she is forced to develop in herself is what makes her what she is. In other words, uh, to go a little more theoretically, I don't know how far this will be interesting for the rest of you. We talk about the symbiotic and the symbolic, which are two different aspects of representation. In the symbolic, you are actually representing something else to replace something. But in the semiotic, you are actually trying to not a form of replacement, but a, uh, a realignment of feelings and thoughts in a process that is not uh, linear in a, what you would say, in a concentric set. Uh, there was also this moment which talked about how women's experiences are never linear. They are always cyclic. And this relates to our periods as well, because every, every month a uh, woman has her periods and her womb gets ready to accept uh, a child. So this a woman's life is always controlled by the uh, cyclical, uh, what you say, time frame in which she lives. But a man is not controlled like that in that cyclical framework. So in that cyclical framework, when you realize that, when uh, in a, a, a semiotic stage, you are actually part of something that is different. You cannot be represented. And that is why in a mirror stage, when you talk about a mirror stage, you're saying you look at a mirror and you see yourself. And in many of her writings, Arno keeps on asking, who am I? Do you see yourself? Now, each one of us can see us on the screen, but are you the real self? Are you a different self?
because you 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 cannot have a what to say a single plane of reference you have multiple planes of reference that's there are so many layers of you which uh, is uh, not caught in a mirror and that is why she says it cannot be caught in a photograph it cannot be caught in a frame you have to uh, right go into yourself those concentric circles the cycle and that is why kasteva is very uh, significant for as uh, a theorist of course arno we don't know uh, was uh, influenced by rigare or uh, julia kasteva but of course she refers to simon de beauvoir there's a reference and she says my mother died two days after simon de beauvoir died or something like that there's a reference in Uh, that in a woman's story thank you ma'am it was a very interesting talk uh, and uh, we got a very uh, good introduction about the writer uh, where do you get uh, do you get the translations uh, i mean uh, the books as such do you get yeah modern book center had some of these books but they said they sold out but they got it for me oh so that is why i could uh, say yes to usha <laughs> okay man. really nice usha thank you jamila thank you so much for taking so much time in reading all these books and uh, making it in average form and telling us that is very you. difficult you know yes. because my pleasure it is always i always find it a pleasure to read books so yeah, because you are not a task at all for me i love the reading you are a teacher huh? you are a teacher so uh, not a teacher i have always loved books so <laughs> oh, more as i said you know more than pictures more than frames you know the words actually capture something yeah. much more yeah so it is what you make of the words where she says that uh, photos will not give you that picture then you know when you start thinking they really don't they are very you know what do you say very flat and very unfeeling uh, things photos but writing brings out the uh, feelings and the you know the atmosphere and it captures the whole thing so when she says that it really resonates uh, with your thoughts isn't it yeah and uh, the, uh, uh, it is interesting that we st- uh, started this type of lectures uh, with a, uh, a lecture by jamila on uh, Greek, yeah, uh, because uh, she she won the Nobel Prize in twenty twenty, and we called that lecture celebrating women, and uh, it is I am really happy that again after two years another woman has won the uh, Nobel Prize and we are again celebrating a uh, woman here. So it is actually though uh, that uh, the first lecture was not under the literary and cultural forum as Jamila explained that was formed after that. Uh, so uh, counting that lecture this is actually the 24th or the second anniversary yeah lecture yes. that we have yeah. heard today so it has been a really enjoyable journey good journey As she enjoyable. said uh, we have had uh, a lot of very interesting people from very interesting fields coming and talking to us about uh, not only literature literature culture art forms dance drama painting everything uh, we have been able to cover it has been a, a great experience and uh, i must say that jamila has been the a strong pillar she has uh, been arranging all these lectures and she has been identifying the speakers and the topics and i hope that uh, we are able to uh, go on and continue this for many more years but i only hope that we are able to get more people into the group that is important okay. Uh, today actually what happened was that because of that problem with the link i wish somebody had pointed it out earlier so that i could have rectified it uh, but only after we started the meeting yeah. many people started messaging that uh, they could not uh, uh, reach the site i don't know why it was uh, it may be because our zoom uh, uh, that uh, uh, subscription ended in october and we got it renewed so the maybe because of that uh, this confusion has happened i'm really sorry for that otherwise we would have had i'm sure at least double the number watching here but i'm sure a lot of uh, people will be watching on youtube youtube yes <laughs> yes so if uh, so, so we shall next interactions can we uh, wind up 
Yeah, we will find out. So, so we'll uh, continue as usual on the first Saturday of every month now. Uh, that in the previous uh, webinars we have announced earlier we were having on uh, for on the first thursday then we shifted it to first friday uh, then many people pointed out that on a working day it is very difficult to join so now we have made it uh, the first saturday of every month so we yeah. hope to continue this for uh, many more saturdays i thank all of you for joining us and uh, especially for those who have uh, uh, continued till this uh, last uh, minute Thank you so much and hope to see you again next month. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Harmony, for uh, thank you, thank helping you. me host this. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila, again. Thank Special you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.